all the way over to your left, uh, to United States Marshal Michael East. Uh, next to him, of course, is your sheriff, Ennis Wright. And next to him is the Homeland Security Investigation President Agent in Charge, Brian Petty. Uh, to my left is uh, the United States Attorney, Robert J. Higdon, Jr. Uh, he'll be the first speaker. He comes to us with a lot of experience as a prosecutor, over 25 years as a federal prosecutor. And uh, I'll just ask him to come up and make some remarks. Thank you, Don. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I'm pleased to be joined by important law enforcement partners, including the United States Marshal and the leadership of federal and local law enforcement agencies involved in this investigation. On June the 19th, 2019, a federal grand jury sitting here in the Eastern District returned a sealed eight count indictment charging 31 individuals and one business entity with a scheme to defraud the federal government and the Commonwealth of Virginia of millions of dollars in tax revenues from the sale of cigarettes. This investigation entitled Operation Southern Lights targeted these 32 defendants in an effort to end this large-scale tax fraud and to hold these defendants accountable for the millions in lost tax revenues as a result of their illegal scheme. As you may know, laws and regulations governing the distribution of tobacco products permit the federal government to levy an excise tax on the manufacturers of cigarettes and an excise tax on the wholesalers of cigarettes. Retailers are required to collect sales tax and the interstate shipment of tobacco products is regulated by federal law. Relevant to this indictment, you should know that the state of New York requires that each pack of cigarettes sold at the retail level have a tax stamp affixed to the pack evidencing the fact that the pack has been subjected to that state's revenue authority. North Carolina does not have a stamp requirement, but generally the stamps are purchased and affixed to the individual it may be. The printing and issuance of such tax stamps is also closely regulated. A standard pack of cigarettes consists of 20 individual cigarettes. A carton of cigarettes consists of 10 packs. A case of cigarettes can consist of either a master case, which contains 60 cartons, or a half case, which contains 30 cartons. Master cases are manufactured in such a way that they can be easily divided into two half cases, thereby allowing the wholesaler to easily reduce a master case to a half case for purposes of affixing the tax stamps. In practice, the retailer normally only receives shipments of half cases with the tax stamps already affixed to the individual packs. State excise taxes in North Carolina from 2018 to 2019 were $4.50 per carton. State excise taxes in New York for the same period were $43.50 per carton. If the carton were purchased in New York City, where there is an additional excise tax of $15 per carton, a customer would pay a total of $58.50 per carton in state and city taxes. Thus, during the relevant time period, the differential between the cost of a carton of cigarettes in North Carolina and the cost of the same carton of cigarettes in New York rose as high as $54 per carton, or $3,240 per master case. The grand jury in count one of the indictment returned in mid-June alleges that the 31 individuals and the one business entity listed in the indictment was to profit from the purchase of cigarettes with cash in North, pay for it with cash in North Carolina, drive those cigarettes to the Northeast, and sell them at the going rate without paying the applicable sales tax. This is all alleged to be in violation of Title 18, United States Code Section 20, to trafficking in contraband cigarettes and smokeless tobacco as well as in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 371, which is the general conspiracy statute. It is alleged in the indictment that members of the conspiracy would repeatedly purchase large quantities of cigarettes from Justin Brent Freeman, age 37, of Hope Mills, North Carolina, through a business he operated called Freeco Incorporated in Fayetteville, North Carolina, as well as from other cigarette wholesalers in Fayetteville, Raleigh, and Goldsboro, and then transport those quantities of cigarettes to New York City. 
As a general rule, after purchasing the cigarettes from Freeman and Freeco Incorporated or one of the other retailers, members of the conspiracy would then promptly prepare for transporting the cigarettes to the Northeast by using a full-size van or rental truck and cross into the Commonwealth of Virginia and travel to either Richmond or Alexandria. In Virginia, the cigarettes would be transferred to another member of the conspiracy who would continue the transportation to Syracuse, New York. There, additional members of the conspiracy would transfer the cigarettes, transportation, and distribution in the New York City area. The indictment lists 47 overt acts or steps taken by members of the conspiracy in furtherance of the charged crimes in an effort to demonstrate and prove the manner in which the crime was committed by those charged. These are not the only or all of the actions taken by the charged defendants, but they are among the acts taken which with, uh, with gov the government will use to prove the charged conspiracy. Counts two through seven allege six specific counts and who were part of the charged conspiracy in count one, knowingly shipped, transported, received, and possessed contraband cigarettes in amounts greater than 10,000 cigarettes, which bore no evidence of the payment of applicable state cigarette taxes in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Each of these instances is alleged to be in violation of Title 18, United States Code Section 2342A as well. And finally, Count 8 alleges that all 32 defendants, the 31 individuals and Freeco Incorporated, were engaged in, in a conspiracy to United States Code Section 1956H. In this count, the grand jury alleges that members of the conspiracy, A, conducted and attempted to conduct financial transactions affecting interstate commerce, with it, which involved the proceeds of specified unlawful activity, that is cigarette trafficking, with the intent to further the goals of that crime, and that they knew that the property involved in the crime was in fact the proceeds of some form of unlawful activity. And secondly, or B, that again, while they conducted or attempt to conduct the specified unlawful activity, again, cigarette trafficking, part to conceal and disguise the nature, location, source, ownership, and control of the proceeds of the unlawful activity. So in sum, the money laundering conspiracy count alleges that the members of the conspiracy were trying to either further the goals of the conspiracy of the crime or to conceal the crime by using the proceeds of the crime in some way or to do both those things. If convicted of count one, the general conspiracy to traffic in contraband cigarettes, each defendant faces up to five years in federal prison and fines of up to, if convicted of counts two through seven, each defendant named therein faces up to five years in federal prison and fines of up to $250,000 or twice the gain obtained, whichever is greater or both. And if the defendants were convicted to be convicted of money laundering as alleged in count eight, they each face up to 20 years imprisonment, a $500,000 fine or twice the value of the property involved in the transactions, whichever is greater or both. I should also point out that the grand jury has included a forfeiture notice in the indictment that the items of property listed in that notice and any other property which is the proceeds of or involved in the crime is forfeitable to the United States. Moreover, the forfeiture notice conservatively calculates the gross proceeds of the crimes alleged in the indictment at over $12 million and designates that amount as forfeitable to the United States as well. It is also important to note that each of these defendants named in the indictment is presumed innocent at this point under our Constitution. And it will be my office's responsibility to prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury if the defendants or any one of them should exercise their right to a trial. We are prepared to undertake that obligation if necessary. We are announcing the indictment at this time because last week, the investigative agencies represented here today, working closely with our United States Marshal, attempted to arrest the 31 individual defendants named by the grand jury. 25 of the named defendants were arrested, three in the Commonwealth of Virginia, three in the state of Florida, and 19 in the Eastern District of North Carolina. The remaining defendants will be pursued as aggressively as possible. Each of the defendants who has been arrested made an appearance before a United States magistrate judge as required by law. In each instance, they were advised of the charges pending against them and a determination about bond status was made by the court. That status as well as other information about the charged and arrested defendants 
will be noted on a, ch on the, uh, a chart that we'll provide to you. While executing the arrest warrants, marshals and investigators also executed 14 search warrants and two seizure warrants for funds held in financial institutions. In executing those warrants, approximately $840,000 in the United States currency, 11 vehicles believed to be involved in or concealing the nature of criminal activity, 4,723 cartons of cigarettes, and five firearms. This is an ongoing investigation we are determined to identify and charge all members of the conspiracy who played a meaningful role in the crime. We also intend to determine exactly how the illegal proceeds were used, who received them, and for what purpose. In short, this matter is just getting started. This is not the conclusion of our investigation. It is simply they did amazing work, and they did it safely. Let me turn to our United States Marshal Mike East for any remarks he'd like to make. Thank you, U.S. Attorney Higgin. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, my marshal supervisors and task force officers for conducting probably one of the largest uh, multiple district agencies, multiple state investigations in the Eastern District's history. This was a highly... Mr. Higgins said we arrested, we actually got 26, one just got picked up this morning, so we have 26. Oh, correct, 26 yeah. now. Um, using separate, separate, separate arrest teams in five different states simultaneously. We hit places in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, and New York simultaneously, which is why we had the results that we did. A total of 99 deputy U.S. Marshals and task force officers made up these massive teams. And again, thank you to my staff for coordinating such a great roundup. Um, the results speak for themselves, $840,000 seized in U.S. currency, 11 vehicles that are seized for forfeiture, firearms, 4,723 cards of cigarettes, um, which were confiscated from the defendants, and based on our math is a, a, a low-end street value of $257,000 in $404. The enforcement operation directly impacted both domestic and foreign criminal operations, and we are here to say that we are not going to stand by and let anybody take advantage of the citizens of North Carolina or the United States of America. We cannot do any of this without our partners from HSI, so thank you, uh, Mr. Pagan, for allowing us to participate in this, and thank you, Sheriff Wright, for our long-going and historical relationship with you all. We are committed to taking back North Carolina from, the, from our suspects, and we, as Mr. Higgins said, we will continue these operations in the future. This is only the beginning. Thank you. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Pagan with the HSI. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Brian Fagan. I'm the resident agent in charge of Homeland Security Investigations, uh, the Raleigh office. Our office in investigates hundreds of crimes, including contraband smuggling. In April 2018, my office, along with the organized crime unit from the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, began investigating bulk sales. In certain instances, the volume of tobacco purchased was significantly more than the population in nearby townships and cities, which served as a red flag. Our team of investigators determined that bulk cash purchases were being made to Frico International, a major tobacco di distribution company in Fayetteville. However, the cigarettes were not being sold to North Carolina retailers. Around this time, local authorities saw a spike in bulk cash seizures along major transportation corridors from North Carolina to New York. Our investigation revealed that rental car cigarettes to multiple stash houses and storage units. From there, the tobacco products were transported from North Carolina to New York and Virginia to evade taxes imposed on tobacco products. In return, the vehicles were loaded with bulk cash for the return trip back to North Carolina in violation of U.S. federal laws. That leads us to today. This scheme resulted in millions of dollars of lost tax revenue for North Carolina and the indictments of 31 individuals and one business. Contraband smuggling is not a victimless crime. When criminal networks exploit our nation's tax laws to smuggle goods, they rob us as residents of tax revenue that provides and maintains services to the communities they live in. I want to thank Mike East for your help with all the marshals, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Bobby Higgins, and I'd like to introduce Sheriff Wright from Cumberland County Sheriff. Good morning. I'm not going to go back over all the stats that everybody just went over. I just want to say, uh, this was the collective effort between local and state federal law enforcement. Um, I want to give praise to my team, uh, my OCU. Uh, those guys worked 
95 corridor, you'd be surprised while you were asleep, they were traveling. <laughs> they were following vehicles. You know, uh, criminal elements uh, figure we sleep. We don't. Law enforcement is 24-7. Uh, uh, you know, we, we never sleep. And these guys, uh, they work endless nights and days out there uh, following these guys. But uh, again, uh, I'm not going to go through all the stats and stuff. But just to let everyone know, and the criminal element that's out there, if you're trying to get past, some lady we're going to catch you. Okay. And Cumberland, we're a large county. We're one of the fifth largest county in this state. So if you think you're getting away with criminal activities, think again. Because somebody's watching. Okay. But like I say, without all the other agencies, the federal, local, and state, uh, I have to give. Um, Kudos to my my fellow sheriffs in Robinson County and uh, Johnson County. They also assisted with the search warrants. Like he said, it took a lot of manpower to execute those search warrants. The money is that North Carolina lost, along with Cumberland County, lost millions of dollars in tax revenue that these folks was running up and back and forth to New York for these cigarettes. That's a lot of money that could have been put back into this economy to go to schools. You know, plus help me with equipment. So again, I want to thank everyone that's standing, standing to my left and right. Again, to all my officers, I always say the guys that's in the trenches are the ones doing the work. We just stand up here and take the kudos for it. But again, I reach out to my people. So again, thank you. We have you trying to take your questions. Um, born, I guess that's the, is that the Homeland Security? Is this bigger than cigarettes? Uh, well, we don't know uh, where the money was going. And so right now we're focused on cigarettes focused on the failure to pay taxes on the cigarettes. That's what the grand jury considered, and that is the focus of our case at this point. Is there, is there any thought that it might be going to, to um, assist terrorist operations? I wouldn't want to speculate on any purpose right now. We will certainly be pursuing all avenues of the investigation, and if we are able to determine where it was going, we'll let you know. But right now, that's the limit of what I'm able to say to you. Uh, of the, the folks who have been um, arrested, can, can you tell me how many are in uh, behind bars and how many made bond? Or, or what the bond uh, was set at? I can't tell you off the top of my head, but we, we will give you that information before you leave here. Uh, I know Mr. Myers in my office has, a, it has uh, prepared that for you. Uh, you started in April of uh, 2018. Uh, taxing on cigarettes has been going on for some time. How long do you think this has been going on? Is this, uh, you mentioned this is the tip of the iceberg, but do you believe it was going on much longer than that, and meaning that there's much more money that's been lost? In, in this specific case, is that what you're asking? Yes. Well, the grand jury uh, allegations has been going on since sometime in 2018. But this is not a new type of crime. My past, I know of at least two occasions when I served as criminal chief of the U.S. Attorney's Office that we prosecuted similar matters. They may have had different purposes. We'll find out what this one was. But this is a, a type of crime that we have focused on before. Do you know how much uh, tax money was lost? by the state of North Carolina and Cumberland County? I don't know if you've added it up or not. Uh, well, the grand jury has alleged that the value of the crime is a little over $12 million. We'd have to break it down in terms of taxing authorities. That would be the state, you mean? Well, that's just the, the value of the crime that was committed, and okay. it would be apportioned among the, the uh, three states that we've talked about in the federal government. What actually led to the initial investigation? What triggered getting into it? Well, I think you heard uh, both Mr. Padian and the sheriff talk about the fact that they saw uh, uh, purchases being made that were wildly out of proportion to even the population of the local areas. I mean, they monitor this type of thing when you see outliers, when you see sales occurring that can't be explained through the normal course of business, you start to take a look at those things and that's what they did. Can you explain what the law says about this? You can manufacture here, but you also have to sell in the state. You can't cross state lines. Just explain the Well, no, of course, we manufacture cigarettes here right. in North Carolina, as do other states authorities have different opportunities to levy taxes. North Carolina has levied certain taxes on uh, the sale of cigarettes. New York has a, a levied different taxes. And they, of course, differ around the country. Where the federal government comes invo becomes involved is when you engage in interstate commerce. I mean, that's where most of our criminal authority rests anyway, because that's where the Congress has the authority to pass laws governing or controlling behavior. And so this is a very typical type of thing for the Congress to have done. A typical type of thing for us to be involved in is when there is a crime that is crossing state lines that affects the interstate uh, commerce authority of the federal government, as did this crime, and that's when we become involved. Do you have a list of the local people who were arrested, like the names and addresses? Yes, we'll provide you with a list of that, yes. Thank you. Could this be considered a RICO case? What, 
you know, so many different organizations, so many different states, so many people involved? Well, RICO is a very specific type of crime. The grand jury has not returned a RICO charge, so I would not call this a RICO matter. It is certainly an organized scheme to violate the taxing laws of the federal government, the state of North Carolina, the state of New York, and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes, the cigarettes, I guess, is nothing that can be taxed across the board. Um, across the country, which would just basically eliminate the profit, profiteering. Well, I am, I am no tax expert, so all I can speak to is the way the Congress and the state uh, authorities have chosen to regulate it, and that's what we're trying to enforce, but you'd have to stick with somebody else if you want more of a commentary on uh, taxing options. Anybody else? You mentioned that this was such a wide-scale operation with I heard 99 officers. How dangerous of an operation was this? I know we're not talking about Every every operation that we every operation that we undertake when we're serving federal or state warrants is dangerous. Um, we're not looking for people who need parking tickets. We're looking for people who have a lot to lose that may be violent or may become violent. And I'm proud of the fact that the men and women of the Marshal Service never underestimate who they go up against. And same with our task force officers too. We train for specifically for that. So our goal is we just what we have here: 100 percent safety for all everybody concerned, the suspects as well as our people. You said the money was laundered. What did, what did they do with the money? Did they buy businesses or, you know, specifically? Well, money laundering has a wide range uh, of definitions. And as we, you heard when I talked about the charges the grand jury brought, uh, the money was used to further the crime. So you're basically you're plowing money back into the criminal activity. In this case, buying more cigarettes, you, you perpetuate the crime. And you also make efforts to conceal the crime. And so everything they did to hide what they were doing, renting vans, uh, renting places to store the, the cigarettes in other states and so forth, to prevent us from detecting it and arresting them is part of the effort to conceal it. That's also money laundering. So those, those are the two types of things the grand jury has focused on. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here.